An increasing amount of trusted name brands have either been bought out or made outside of their respective country of origin. A few examples are with Doc Martin for the UK, although uh, note Doc Martin was originally a German improving the uh, Germans World War II boot that he had after an injury. Uh, Swandry Bush shirts for the New Zealand, and even RM Williams or Blundstone for Australia. These tools are often recommended by the user with their decades old pair, you know, that was made in the 90s, the 80s, or 2000s perhaps. However, the new management have often replaced a few duds with few worthy exceptions. In the case today with elastic sided ankle length boots, or otherwise known as Australian work boots, Blundstone is the highlighted example. Having scrapped the 360 Australian workers and been made overseas in Thailand and India since 2007, uh, 10 years ago today, a sharp decline in this tool's lifespan has followed. A consumer today, as a result, has to be more aware than ever. One cannot expect to make purchases with the best value in mind without reading into these fine details today. <clears throat> For this moment in time, September of 2017, I believe Redback Boots presents this best value replacement to Blundstone's Made in Australia market. And surprisingly, for the same price range as Blundstone of around 100 USD, sometimes more, sometimes left, less. And USD is US dollars. But uh, actually, I've also I've typically noticed that it's usually around $20 less than Blundstone. Um, I have currently owned my pair of Redbacks for more than a year, about a year and a half now, wearing them daily. And based upon my personal research and evaluation of my own pair's wear, I expect them to last three or more years. And by the way, if they don't, I will make sure to either remove or update this review. However, I've seen one review with a demolished 10-year-old pair before the user threw them away. And as much as I appreciate uh, high-quality footwear that's welted, uh, stitched sole, that can be resold, refurbished using the same ankle leather uh, piece, uh, increasing the footwear's lifespan to decades, uh, there is a simple appreciation for a product using more expendable materials wisely. Welted footwear usually comes at a higher cost or investment uh, weight and overall maintenance to keep it up to condition. These, in comparison, are easy to slide on, use a lighter yet durable outsole, and with a three-year estimated lifespan or more, are still a relative bargain at about $30 a year or less. <clears throat> Furthermore, there is an option I will link into resoling your footwear in the United States of America uh, if the outsole here ends up crapping out. Aside from the subjective recommendation, there are a couple of points I would like to make about them for any interested consumer. First is the anatomy. From my own research on clothing throughout history, trends tend to sway from practical to fashionable. <laughs> One only needs to look at uh, the Krakow, or I think it was also called the Poulain, uh, where during the Battle of Sempach, uh, where it was Austria versus uh, the first Swiss, Swiss Confederacy, I think the old Swiss Confederacy is what it was called, soldiers had to cut off the tips of their pointy boots of the Poulain or the Krakow uh, in order to run and engage the enemy on foot. There was actually piles of these tips that were cu found cut off after the battle. Um, and aside from cost, this may be the biggest setback for people. Style. It's also my biggest contention. Does the user style themselves based around the tool? Or does the user style the tool based around their self-identity or whatever else they want to call themselves or personalize their being? Fortunately, I'm only arguing on the point of practicality today. The red back boot design is strictly for practical. Ergonomic durability, ease of use, function over form. For style, deal with it or pay more without it. They look like a tennis shoe mated with a work boot. <clears throat> Ergonomics. Akin to the original Doc Martin's design intention being for positive foot health, these are another interpretation with a similar mindset. Their website states, 
The Redback Sole has been designed in consultation with leading podiatrists. The anatomy, anatomic wedge sole profile is designed to re reduce arch flexion or sagging. Subsequent foot fatigue um, and referred leg and backache. This profile encourages normal foot functioning, including maintaining forefoot flex flexibility, fore to hind foot, and heel stability. Uh, just a second. And in my opinion, it works. The insole <clears throat> could be better. Um, I have it right here. Uh, for a laceless shoe, my expectations were never high. But with the right size, it is an extremely comfortable shoe. I do wish the toe box had a little bit more curve for the big room to splay out right here. Um, this is where your big toe would go. Um, but I understand designing a standardized laceless shoe makes for impossible perfection. And what I mean by that is the fact that there is nothing to support your foot. And my main three things are it's supporting, uh, it's tight around, or it's confines your foot around the arch, the end step here, <clears throat> and then above that, the ankle. Uh, you do not want it around the toe box, and that's where my criticism comes in, where it kind of pushes your big toe in. In all honesty, ergonomics tends to be a one-sided subject. Support-based footwear comprising of insoles, arch support, cushion versus no support, and letting your foot muscles deal with the workflow, the orthotic versus no support minimalism, is as contentious as the argument of natural fabrics versus synthetic crowd. In other words, your mileage may vary as there are pros and cons to, with each argument. This one certainly does with, uh, it, it, you know, again, if it's using podiatrists uh, to find it, more often than not, that school of thought tends to prefer, prefer the more support. <clears throat> the minimalism usually wouldn't even have any sort of heel at all. Me, I tend to think it's the tool's purpose that it defines its comfort. I wouldn't want to work barefoot, standing on concrete all day. However, a heavy heel strike, and that's where your heel will hit right here, is worse for your body walking on hard surfaces such as concrete or treadmills. And it's also very bad for your body. <clears throat> and, and why I say that is because Every time you step on your heel, it sends a shockwave of your bone through your bones because there's less. There's I think there's actually no muscles specifically in the heel. They're mostly in the forefoot, and so it sends a vibration from your foot up your knee, up your back, and can, uh, up to your neck, uh, and can lead to headaches, back problems, etc. In regards to these, though, it works as an all-purpose shoe. Easy to get on. Easy to get on with doing everything I need it to do. It works well, but isn't perfect at any specific task. Oh, and note that your socks will make a huge difference to footwear comfort. My one major contention with the design of the boot is the toe box, as I said. I tend to find this inflexible toward my big toe with its shape curving in too early, as I said. Uh, suspecting it was the sizing, I spoke to someone at Redback and was told to remove the insole here to gauge how the footwear should fit once it was entirely broken in. The real problem is the plastic toe cap outside, inside the toe box, which is past here. You can see when I squeeze it, 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 it the toe cap inside of the leather here is what's pushing it back out. Whereas in here, it's just, it's just the leather pushing it out. Most, um, where was I? The, the real problem is the plastic toe cap inside the toe box. And I found dropping a large weight from a couch or table leg onto the toe cap and just pushing it on here for about a couple days or a week, spread it out enough for me. I have read uh, of cases where people broke the toe cap with a hammer by just smashing it, but I don't. I wouldn't particularly recommend that. And I don't think it, since it's so flexible, I don't even know how you could break or you know splinter that plastic and, and even pull it out or anything like that. Um, but I've also read of people that, excuse me expanded the toe box by putting a plastic bag on the inside of their fridge uh, and using a Ziploc bag, filled it with water, left it in there till the bag froze, and somehow it would expand the toe box here. Um, I have yet to try that, though. Um, <clears throat> sizing. 
This and the polyurethane section are the most important content for this footwear. Australian sizing is different than U.S. sizing. For one, do not trust your current footwear sizing unless it was accurately measured. Go to any shoe store and use their Brannock device to determine your actual size. And I believe now they even have computers where you can just put your foot on it and it'll measure it for you. Most athletic shoes, tennis shoes, whatever, especially use vastly different sizing. I think it's kind of like the penis deal where they want you to make your foot feel a little bigger because if your foot's a little bigger, then you know what else is a little bit bigger. It makes no sense, though, and I would recommend you try not to make sense of some of the shoe sizing. Uh, just in general, though, made to order uh, leather shoes, blah, blah, blah. Custom shoes tend to be a, use that sizing method a little bit more accurately. Um, use the socks that you would, uh, if you want, if you have to measure at home, use the socks you would use when measuring. In worst case scenario, you can trace your feet at a 90 degree angle, uh, using a pin. And you would, what I mean by that is when you're tracing, you want to make sure your pin's straight down, not curved inward, not curved outward. You want to follow the outline of your foot that way. Uh, on a hard surface and make sure you're pushing your foot down. In fact, it's easier if you're just standing up and someone else is doing it because your foot's sagging out as much. It's sort of an inflating outward. I can't find a better word. Uh, mark the extreme length at the toe to heels after you measure. Uh, so basically right there and then with the heel right there. Um, mark the extreme length at the toes to the heel and measure. Same goes for the width uh, here and here uh, because Australian footwear is sized different than in the U.S. The whole number Australian size, and I'll explain this in a second, it's, it's a bit confusing, uh, is the standard width, or if you're a men's, it's D width, for their respective length, while the half size is the wide width for that respective size. For example, a 7 <laughs> is a standard width, or a D width, for the seven size, whereas seven and a half is the seven size with the wider width, or in the U.S. it would be an E width. Um, in my case, I am an eight and a half U.S. My Australian size from an eight and a half U.S. would technically be a seven and a half Australian, just because it's uh, one size smaller. However, since I do not fit that wider width, I would size even further down to the standard width of seven Australian. Um, and I. Fortunately, I had a couple people that I could borrow their footwear to display this comparison. So as you can see right here, the cleaner pair, or the one I've been showing this whole time, is a 7. Um, and the one here is a 7 and a half. Um, and they are, well, I can't show both of them in here. They are the same width, or the same, fuck, the same length. Uh, however, borrowed someone else's, and this is the size 9, or 8, excuse me, it would translate, though, to a 9 U.S. Uh, lengthwise. And this, once you go to a 9, you do get the extra length. All right? So, and you might uh, have looked at this and been asking why this nasty, dirty pair, the 7.5 here, right here, doesn't look as wide as the other. Well, I, like I was saying, with the chair leg and the uh, table leg, I compressed my pair down. So you can actually see that this, when I pressed it down, uh, it made the bulbousness of that plastic toe cap go down and spread out in width just a little bit. Whereas this one has not been compressed, and you can still see that it has the bulb. However, take note, the 7.5 here is the wider E-width, and this the 7 would just be an E-width. And so that means that with Australian sizing, uh, you do not get those half sizes. You are, I don't know why my camera's doing this. With, Austra <laughs> with Australian width, you are stuck with, you know, if you're an eight uh, US, you would be a seven Australian. And if you're an eight and a half, you have to determine whether you want to size up or down. Generally, sizing recommends a finger, a finger's width of extra room in the toe box to the end. And what I mean by that is 
your finger's width before your toe rams into that edge. It is generally good to have more room in the toe box and it can actually lead to problems later on if that if you don't have that extra room. For these, I sized down though and I would usually recommend, as I said, sizing up. Since a size 9 lost a significant amount of the arch support when I borrowed my friends and was significantly less comfortable standing. Again, just because my because again, there's no way to tighten this down any more than the elastic here in the leather's own rigidity. rigidity. Uh, I, I My foot was just sliding around. My ankles were uncomfortable at the end of the day. It lost all of the, the support that I had in the from using the lower size despite the issues with the toe box. Um, <clears throat> for these, I sized down. Since a size 9 lost a significant amount of the arch support, and was significantly less comfortable standing. Since most people base their decisions on style, these are a big looking shoe relative to size. You'll more often see other people recommending to size down rather than up, particularly when in between sizes. Once again, for a laceless boot, sizing is going to be extremely difficult, especially with online ordering. The leather and elastic pushing against the insole slash outsole um, are the you know what I mean by is this um, are the only thing securing the arch and heel for a non-sliding ergonomic fit. I sat on sizing up or down recommendations for about three months before making this review, since Australia's sizing leaves a, leaves a gap for people that use half sizes, and my own issues in using these and you know ultimately customizing them by pushing this down. Unless you plan to add a thicker insole than the one right here and plan to use a thick pair of socks with it, then that is the only situation I would recommend sizing up if you are stuck between a half size. Only under both of those circumstances, again, would I recommend sizing up. Again, thick socks, and I'm talking about thick wool socks, and something that is more dense and, uh, you know, of an insole or thicker and or. <clears throat> um, and, and one more thing I wanted to show was what I'm the con if you take a tracing of the of a general foot or a healthy foot that hasn't been conformed to shoes for their whole life, uh, you'll tend to see that the part where the big toe is follows more of a flat line here. Uh, and, and so what I'm talking about the big toe is it it just curves in. It, it's better than most shoes, but it curves in just a bit too much for me. Man, I really hate the fact that that's auto adjusting. So here's an example of a sort of a more natural of a contour uh, of a foot shape for in my opinion where it's just a, a little bit more straight around here uh, and again there's just another comparison there uh, hopefully that you get the idea all right on to worksmanship materials leather stitching what have you uh, the overall finish the leather is thick enough for its intended use and lifespan now this is uh, my own recommendation, but I tend to go with black since I have noticed a trend where black leather and footwear tends to be just a bit thicker than the other leather colors that they use uh, and or made with the intention of harder use. For all I know though, that might be my own fairy tale. And what I mean by that is, again, I just think that uh, when they're making leather work boots, I think most people intend black to be that blend of professional, I don't care, and, and sort of business. Uh, look and therefore they tend to use just a slightly bit maybe the better leathers get dyed black I, I don't know or just the thicker ones I've also noticed that with uh, some of the hipster crowds they tend to prefer thinner leather just because it's it breaks in easier blah 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 um, I appreciate that the boot is unlined and what I mean by that is that this leather here is has no lining in it, no cotton or anything else. It's just the suede part of the leather. Uh, and, and it's also because a leather that's untreated with silicone or other cotton slash Gore-Tex linings tends to breathe very well. And the problem I've noticed with Gore-Tex is they say it breathes, but water gets trapped between the leather and the Gore-Tex and it ends up breaking down the leather quicker. Uh, most marks rub out with this leather. And what I mean by that is you just rub out if there's a scratch and it you know, mostly goes away. Um, and the 
outsole is pushed out well enough around the boot to prevent the upper getting nicked easy. And again, what I mean is there's just enough thickness here that if you run into a stairway or, you know, a stair, a stair specifically or a rock or something, it's less likely to end up scratching the leather. I do not know if I would recommend the suede version they sell, though. Um, it looks like a suede, but it's cut from the... It looks like a suede that is cut from the best layers of leather rather than uh, just being flipped from the grain side. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, this leather is typically weaker and may stretch to the point of being a sizing nuisance to the user of the boot. I have also seen two cases of poor elastic and or stitching in the boots. Um, I am willing to dismiss it, dismiss it though as a few duds from the company, but it's worth mentioning. And what I mean with the leather is once again, as I said, the only thing securing your foot here, you know, is the elastic here, you know, which stretches very easy uh, and over time will wear, and the actual leather here, and you're praying that that doesn't stretch so it can keep holding your foot down instead of you just sliding up here and ramming your toe. Um, and what I mean by the suede aspect is there's two sides of the leather. Hopefully I'm correct. I believe this is called the grain side, and this is called the suede side, this sort of nubby hair side. And the problem is, is sometimes you can just do it where you, you flip the leather around. So this would be the outside, this would be the inside. Um, but sometimes this is the top layer of the leather. It's typically the more durable part of the leather. And so if you, you can also do it where you don't even have this part when they cut the leather down because the leather could be so thick that you wouldn't even want to use it in footwear. That it's just, it's just two parts of this sort of uh, fleshy leather. And that, that stuff tends to be not as durable. It tends to stretch very easy, too. All right, polyurethane. This is the next and perhaps the most important section if you even plan to buy this footwear. The polyurethane midsole and process of hydrolysis is the most important aspect to know. From their website, it states, Polyurethane is a plastic material a polymer composed of a chain of organic units uh, joined by carbamate links. Redback and their subsidiary blue tongue footwear are made up of polyurethane in the midsoles, thus creating the lightweight, long-lasting footwear you find in our products. While polyurethane is very flexible, light, and durable, it can be susceptible to hydrolysis if not used properly. Hydrolysis is a reaction when undistributed polymolecules sit for extended periods of time, <clears throat> they become weaker, thus leading to problems such as sole disintegration. The best way to avoid hydrolysis is to use your boots. Wearing them will keep the polyurethane molecules alive and make them last. Storing our boots for a long time amount of time can create this process of hydrolysis. And what they mean is this right here is your polyurethane. And as I will explain it ahead, this outside here, which is more of a, a clear or fluorescent, or I don't even know what the word is, a clear texture, is TPU, or I think it's called thermoplastic polyurethane. So I'm not sure if it actually also has the same effects as polyurethane. And again, just you know, most uh, sneakers and athletic shoes now use it just because it's light and it's rigid, and, that's, and they're all, yeah. All right, to note, many modern athletic shoes use polyurethane, I would recommend them using once a week to prevent or retard the process of hydrolysis. Their website outsole section states, the advanced dual density redback sole construction uses no stitching, screws, or glue as over time these methods break down. Advanced technology used by redback means that molten or liquid sole material, their TPU, thermoplastic polyurethane, is formed directly onto the leather fibers under pressure. So the soles actually then become part of the upper. This is the upper, this is the sole. Even though it may not break down like stitching, screws, or glue, you may see the outside or the outsole break apart with this use. And for reference, I will link a few suspected examples of hydrolysis in the description box where basically this stuff just breaks down off of the shoe and and where people end up having footwear that's they haven't used for six months or a year and they take it out and suddenly it's breaking apart and they say this is the worst shoes ever well there you go it's all it's hydrolysis final thoughts 
I do appreciate my nailed on or screwed on nailed or and stitched boots such as firefighter boots, etc. They're my pride or wildland firefighter boots. They're my pride and joy, but I elastic boots like these that are not meant intended to last quote unquote forever. I have an everyday appreciation for. I can see why Australian farmers who may have previously used R.M. Williams or Blundstones would rely on something like this as the perfect balance between a stitched boot that requires maintenance and something cheap and easy like tennis shoes. This farmer is the perfect ethos for this boot as a reliable, low maintenance shit kicker because they have the old world reliability of leather, but they can use new world materials to complement that like um, the outsole being merged to the boot and adding an insole among other comforts. And a balance is certainly what these boots provide. I use them now instead of trail runners be, um, because they're between of trail, uh, the, just so you know, excuse me, they're between the weight of trail runners and welted boots and they're in between durability wise and they're a thousand times easier than put on them easier either. I'm not actually running trails though, so take that with a grain of salt. Either way, they're almost as comfortable as it gets, and I have no problems with them doing what I can do with my boots with their lighter weights on or off the trail. And I'm talking about their lighter weights in regards to other hiking boots, or the, the old school of hiking boots. Using my own rating system, I give these a 4 stars out of 5. They do everything well, but nothing exceptional. They're not my first to grab for any specific task, but fall first often because their ease of putting on and ability to accomplish most any task regardless. My major contention falls in the sizing and ergonomics because of the toe box shape and Australian sizing. While I can make an exception to the latter as a universal size um, that they have to create for most feet, I cannot dismiss the former. Um, since it is not ergonomic towards the human foot. I do like when companies like Redback only sell a few models though, as it tends to indicate their focus on who their product is designed for instead of fashionable flavors of the month. Uh, and again, it just keeps that design that design and, and send a focus on you know, the functional rather than what looks good. Also, I am not sponsored by the company, and this recommendation does not include Redback's Chinese subsidiary, Blue Tongue Footwear. Good day.